We have two episodes of a podcast already out. Yeah, we do. And uh, we're about to drop more. But some people have had some questions for us. And so I just wanted to have a conversation with you about um, some of those questions. Sound like a plan? Sounds great. All right. So first on my list was, um, I get this one a lot. What did you know about any unrest in Venezuela before you went? Uh, I didn't know anything about really what was going on in Venezuela. And really the only thing that I know is Tammy was saying that there were parts in Venezuela that were dangerous. I mean, of course now she says, and everyone else says that they all warned me and told me not to do it. And then I was in big trouble. And, but no one really told me anything. Um, you know, when we were interviewing your brother, I found it really interesting, um, particularly with him, just how he felt about Tammy and how much it changed from that beginning when you'd first met Tammy and you were getting ready to go meet her in person for the first time to, um, later on, did it take a lot of convincing with your family to get them all kind of on board? Um, Derek is, is a big teddy bear, but you got to break him through his little tiny hard shell that he has first. (laughs) <laughs> okay. Uh, All right. I mean, I really didn't have to convince anyone to like her. They got to knew, to know her, and from that point on, they really liked her. And Something that I feel like, um, for me anyway, I've been really excited to to introduce to people is just how awesome Tammy is. Has that been um, fun for you too? Yeah, because everything from from when I was in jail to when we got released was all justice for Josh or Josh, the American, this Josh, that. And you might remember when I was talking to my dad and everyone else, I was always upset about it. I said, it's not justice for Josh. It's not just about Josh. It's Tammy and Josh or justice for Tammy and Josh. Because to me, my wife is in there with me. She's a big part of my life. And, and I felt like we were only trying to get protection for 50% of us. And I know that that negatively affected her as well, even though she doesn't want to admit it or tell people that now. I know back then it was it was hard for her. Something that um, we talk about in the podcast is that at any given point, she could have gotten her freedom. All she had to do was sign a paper. Right. Yeah. And she never did it. If after she she denied it, if they would have actually done it for her. But I do know that, yeah, that was basically the situation was she could have basically never had to go through any of that. She just had to throw me under the bus to put it that way. Um, Another question that I've gotten is whether you witnessed any other torture other than what happened to you and Tammy specifically, did you see anybody else get tortured? Yeah. And this, I actually don't think that this made it into the podcast, but there was uh, a night and I think I remember telling you the story. You might remember, but there was a night where I, I was, I was woken up to just fist hitting flesh type of a sound. It wasn't the type of like punching bag or the wall. It was, it was literally just hitting. And I woke up to it and I went out to the door to where the bars were. And that's where I saw just a police officer, you know, hitting people into the ribs. He was just punching this one guy in his hand. He was handcuffed, you know, with his hands up on the ceiling. And I just started yelling at him. And he basically said, gringo, go back in your cell. This has nothing to do with you. And I, I told him, I said, this has everything to do with me. What you're doing isn't correct. What you're doing doesn't make you a bigger person. So why don't you take the handcuffs off and give him a fighting chance too, if, if that's what you're looking at. Um, and, you know, he just was getting angry with me. And so I finally started yelling and waking everyone up in the Sabine which, you know, in return related to everyone yelling at the police officer, and he ended up taking, you know, this gentleman away up to what we know as the stairs. And hopefully, you know, he wasn't beaten any worse there, but I, I wouldn't doubt that they continued his torture there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, and that kind of speaks to it. Like you and Tammy stayed in prison for almost two years with very little access to legal counsel with, um, you know, for a very, very long time, no visits. Um, Mm -hmm. You didn't get to go outside very much. Um, But that wasn't unique to you either. That was kind of the way that they treat prisoners in the country. Yeah. I mean, they only allowed like a hundred out of the maybe 250, 300 prisoners that were there to actually go out um, once at a time. 
and they only had the opportunity to actually go out twice a week. And so you can imagine, you know, out of seven days, 100 of you will be okay to go out one day and maybe another 100 would be out, would be okay to go out the next day. But it was really just the same people over and over and over again. Um, with my wife, she was in a cell of 35 people. And out of those 35 women, they would only allow four to five to go out at a time. So you can imagine that and imagine how hard it was for, for them to decide who could go out and not go out, the fights that would, you know, boil up just because of arguments because of it. Um, and, you know, that's one thing in that people just don't think about. I mean, yeah, you're, you're a hostage outside of the United States, but there's also different feelings, different arguments, different things that happen just being locked up in prison. I mean, you're treated like an animal. And yeah, I think that people should pay for their crimes, but honestly, I don't seeing how it is to have to be locked up in a cell and seeing how people are treated and seeing how it, how it affects their lives and their mind. I honestly don't know if that's the best route to go to make people pay for the crimes. If they're going to be released back into the, into the public, because you get back released out into the public and your mindset has changed completely. And that, isn't changed positively. And so that's going to affect the way that you act for the rest of your life, which is probably why there are so many people that once they leave prison or jail end up going back because they still have that mentality of, I have to survive in here. And the way that I have to survive here isn't the way that I'm going to survive out in public. Well, I know in a future episode, we're going to talk a little bit about um, how some of your fellow prisoners helped you learn how to get along in prison. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm eager to, to have people hear that. But um, what would you say is kind of your biggest takeaway that you learned while you were in prison? Uh, I would be the biggest takeaway would be learning to control yourself, learning to control your own mind. Um, that is what overpowers every being. And that's not only in prison, that's outside as well. In your own trials that you're going through, I mean, we can see what's going on now in the world and how we allow other people to influence how we're going to act through, situ through different situations. And we need to know who we are, what our morals are, what our values are, and we need to follow those and not fall into peer pressure because sometimes that's what happens. And that's, you know, one of the things I'm trying to teach my daughter who's going into middle school is, you know, say no to drugs, don't do bad things, and be the good girl that you know you need to be. Good advice, dad. <laughs> um, okay, one last thing, and then I think we can probably wrap up. And that's just um, for people who aren't familiar with everything. What are the biggest misconceptions that people have about your story? We talked a little bit about people saying justice for Josh and not including mm -hmm. your wife. What other things do people think they know and they're maybe wrong about? Everyone thinks that I served my mission in Venezuela. That, that is a big one. Uh, and I didn't serve my mission in Venezuela. I served my mission in Everett, Washington. And if you know from the podcast, um, I talk about that. And it's just funny, but still to the day, everyone's like, so what was your mission like down in Venezuela? It's like, no, I, I served my mission in Everett, Washington. Like, oh, where's like Washington to see? I'm like, no, like just north of Seattle, Washington. And they go, oh, okay. It was, uh, it's funny though, because people just hear things and they don't really connect it. Stand. I remember when we first got back, and I think I might have told you this story, but we were walking around in Costco and there was this old lady that was kind of looking at me and of course I had recently just gotten released. And so she was looking at me like, is that, is that the kid? And we walked by her and my dad was paying attention. He was watching her. And so he just decided to stay back just to hear what she said. And my mom and I were walking up and past her and she turns to her husband and was like, see, I told you that is the kid. And he looks up and he goes, who, who is it? And, he, and she goes, it's the kid that was just released from being held hostage. He goes, oh, yeah, from Pakistan, right? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> my, dad was, my dad was trying to hold back the laughter, but it was funny that, you know, we hear things, think of scenarios, and we just have to connect them, even though it may not be, you know, what it really was. And I think when I was held over there hostage, my parents, or maybe the news, I don't know, was trying to, to put it in the news as, hey, he's a return missionary. 
he's not a bad person. And yet they're saying he's a terrorist. They're saying that, you know, he worked for the CIA and he's being sent there to destroy Maduro and their government. And so people, I guess, kind of took that as, oh, yeah, he was in a mission over there. You know, one thing that I have gotten a few times, um, and you've probably gotten this, if, if somebody's brave enough anyway, is uh, did you really do it? <laughs> and, and I know because I've met you that that's just kind of silly to ask, but here's your chance. Did you really do it? I, you know, when people ask me this question, I always look at them straight in the face and I'll say it this way. I say, the guns, the guns weren't mine, but I'm just glad they didn't find the drugs. <laughs> 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 no, I mean, I have you gotten it. your check from the CIA yet? <laughs> <laughs> I, no, they haven't sent it, but I'm still waiting. All right. All right. Well, we can wrap it up there. Uh, we have another episode coming up very, very soon. So make sure you subscribe, rate and review. Anywhere that you listen to podcasts is a great way to find us. And uh, for those of you who are asking if we're going to do transcriptions or provide a Spanish language version, that is something we hope maybe one day to address. We can't do it right now, but that is definitely on our radar. Thanks, Josh. Yeah, see ya.